All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining our 21 Days to COP28 webinar. I'd like to first recognize that I'm hosting this webinar from Wadawarung country. We at the UNGCNA would like to also recognize the traditional owners of the countries where you all are tuning in today and the First Nations people past and present in this webinar. We pay our respects to all elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people and their cultures and their connections to the lands and the waters and beyond of Victoria. We have such an incredible lineup today as we anticipate COP28, and I'm not going to lie, I'm nerding out a bit in regards to today's discussion. So as we get started, let me introduce our fantastic team that will be joining us. Uh, leading us off, we have a quick overview of the UN's historical involvement in COP by newly appointed UNIC Director in Canberra, Damien Cordona Onces. His office provides UN communication support services to Australia and the surrounding region. Then we will have the incredible Dr. Sally Box, who is Australia's head of delegation to the UNFCCC via the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. Sally will also be joining us for further discussion with two other incredible panelists, Professor Robin Eckersley, Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and Redmond Berry Distinguished Professor at the University of Melbourne, and Richard Fechner, who is sending a man massive contingent to COP28 under his leadership as the Executive General Manager Global Advisory at GHD. But first, before I hand it over to Damien and then Sally, we'll have a short video from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. So thanks for that. Let's get started with that video. I am in Nepal to send a message to the world. The rooftops of the world are caving in. This tragedy is unfolding in two perilous chapters. Phase one is the story of melting glaciers and ice sheets. Record temperatures mean record glacier melt. Nepal has lost close to one third of its ice in just over 30 years. Antarctica and Greenland are losing billions of tons of ice mass every year. Melting glaciers mean swollen lakes and rivers flooding, sweeping away entire communities. And seas rising at record rates, threatening coastal communities across the globe. The crisis is gaining speed. Nepal's glaciers melted 65% faster in the last decade than they had in the previous one. That means phase two of this tragedy looms ever larger, the disappearance of glaciers altogether. Glaciers are icy reservoirs. The ones here in the Himalayas supply fresh water to well over a billion people. When they shrink, so do river flows. In the future, major Himalayan rivers like the Hindus, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra could have massively reduced flows, combined with saltwater intrusion that would decimate deltas. That spells catastrophe. Low-lying countries and communities erased forever, millions of people on the move and fierce competition for water and land, and floods, droughts and landslides accelerating worldwide. I'm here to cry out from the rooftop of the world, stop the madness. The glaciers are retreating, but we cannot. We must end the fossil fuel age. We must act now to protect people on the front line and to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees to averse the worst of climate chaos. The world cannot wait. All right, let's hand it over to Damien. Damien, if you want to lead us off here. Thank you very much, Evan. I was saying that our main area of work is advocacy, outreach, uh, public information, strategic communication, etc. So we always try to measure uh, what is the right balance to pass the messages around to the general public. Uh, this message from the Secretary General was not precisely a message of optimism. Uh, we always try, especially when you when we speak to young audiences, is to try to uh, be very strict and very honest in the terrible challenges that we are facing as a planet, but at the same time, leave a little bit of hope, you know, for new generations to think that there's ways 
to mitigate at least if if not to solve what uh, in the big mess that, that we are in in this case the secretary general wanted to be as as strong as he could be in this message. I think it was very, very powerful to do it from the rooftop of the wall, from the Himalayas, to to really send this message of urgency, you know, that I think it's uh, extremely, extremely uh, important. And I I really have received a very, very good feedback on uh, about this message, because what we are trying to do from the United Nations, and I'm sure uh, Sally Box and the other p- panelists will go much more into the details on the technical details, on the processes, on the intergovernmental processes, etc. That the that the entire UNFCC is is doing. But from from our side, what we, we are trying to do is to really raise uh, the the attention of larger audiences. Sometimes the UN we are accused of always preaching to the converted or preaching to the choir. Uh, You know, we organize huge meetings with environmental NGOs, in this case, for example, and everybody agrees with what we're saying. Doesn't mean that we don't have to continue doing that, but we have to get a little bit out of the box, out of the closet, if you allow me to say, and really try to approach people that are not precisely or maybe not as far as complete climate change deniers, which those are probably very difficult uh, to convince, but at least to those in between that are not very much convinced on the big challenges, on the drama uh, that that we're facing. I I just would like to flag a couple of things. Uh, One is that the new crisis or the new uh, vulnerable groups that we never thought before. And uh, I think the pandemic of COVID-19 has given us some taste of of what the effects of climate change also into global health. So that's a complete new area of effects of climate change into our daily life. The second one, and extremely important in the region of the world where we are, uh, the, the Pacific is the new concept of climate migrants. Uh, climate migrants are something that we never thought before. We're talking about refugees, we're talking about economic migrants, but we never maybe paid as much attention as needed uh, to the effects of climate in populations, in regions, even in countries. I mean, uh, uh, we all know uh, small countries in the Pacific might disappear uh, in, in a few years. And, and the populations that live there are trying uh, with their governments to find uh, where to go or, or plan Bs on what is going to happen if the situation continues. Because as I said at the beginning, and I finished with this, uh, we can do mitigation, we can do adaptation, but the damage that has been done is there and, and there's no way to go back. Unfortunately, we don't have yet time machines to go back 50 years. Uh, if we had probably started 50 years ago and the commitment of member states would have been stronger, we will not be uh, where we are now as the secretary general described in his message just a few minutes ago. So thank you very much. And I think that's uh, a little bit of an overview from, from us in Canberra. And I, I'm looking, really looking forward to, to hear the excellent panelists that are, are here this afternoon and that they know this region, they know the effects, they know the challenges, they know the risks, but at the same time, I hope they can transmit us a little bit of hope at the end of our meeting today. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, colleagues of Global Compact, and a good afternoon to all. Thank you so much for joining us, Damien. We really appreciate that. And it was, yeah, such a powerful message. Uh, two of the key things that I heard were urgency and priority, if we had to pick a couple key terms out of there. And next we have Sally Box. Dr. Sally Box will be giving us a bit of an overview of Australia's engagement in COP28 and what some of our priorities are as we urgently move towards um, 
restructuring things and doing um, engaging on a global level. Thank you, Sally. Thanks very much, Evan, and, and thanks uh, to the UN Global Compact for pulling us all together. It's a real privilege to be here uh, with such esteemed panelists. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'm coming to you uh, from Ngunnawal country in Canberra, um, and I'd like to extend that acknowledgement that Evan so um, rightly provided at the beginning to, uh, to First Nations people, um, including those who are online. Um, so today I thought I'd give a bit of a high level overview of COP28. Um, what are the sort of some of the key deliverables under the negotiations? Um, and I, th I think we'll find, you know, our approach is one of urgency and hope too as we approach those negotiations. And also just perhaps give you a little bit of a sense of the UAE presidency's priorities um, for the COP as well. So uh, COP is fast, fast upon us. I think uh, I probably I've just flown in from pre-COP and I think I'm flying out uh, to COP in, in only a couple of short, short weeks. It will take place from uh, the 30th of November to the 12th of December in Dubai. Um, so formally COP is the decision-making meeting of the parties for three climate treaties. It's the 28th conference of the parties to the UNFCCC. It's the fifth conference of the parties to the Paris Agreement and the 18th conference of the parties to, to the Kyoto Protocol. So it is that for, it is those formal things, but but in reality, it's also the preeminent annual international conference on climate change. And so outside the formal procedural process of the treaties, it really brings together actors from across the full span of society uh, for discussions um, on, on a whole range of issues relating uh, to climate change. COPs are now uh, are really large conferences and they're getting bigger. We've heard rumours of around 80,000 people uh, coming through the door at COP28, which blows my mind. Uh, but I, I do think it really reflects the sort of growing momentum behind um, the global economic and energy system uh, transformation that's required to, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and it also reflects the fact that this transformation reflects at you know, really requires action at all levels from uh, consumers to business uh, to industries through to communities and, and governments of all jurisdictions. So um, it is it is much bigger than governments who are who are parties to these treaties now. Um, and it reflects a deep connection between uh, the transformation that's happening and, and many other critically important issues like food security, like mm. health, like biodiversity and, and ecosystem conservation. Um, so So in terms of I guess the, the headline outcomes from each COP meeting really stem from the negotiations and also made from, you know, stem from the big agreements that are made outside the negotiations. Um, and, and I'll have a bit of a chat about both of those. Um, but I think I'd just like to make the point that lots of significant outcomes at COPs occur from at a smaller scale. And that's that stems from the convening power of the COP. It brings together people um, who strengthen their relationships and their partnerships through coming together each year at COP. So uh, there are always the headline outcomes, but there's just that networking of people that happens at COPs and, and builds on those relationships and partnerships that are so critical to climate action. So that's by way of introduction. I, I think I'll talk now um, quickly about the sort of the key deliverables under the negotiations at COP. So really there are three three key deliverables this year, as well as progress due across about 100 different agenda items. So uh, it would be lovely if we could just focus on three, but my negotiators will be running in, running to sort of many different rooms trying to progress lots of lots of different items. But, but the three key deliverables are the global stock take, uh, the global goal on adaptation, and funding arrangements for loss and damage, including a new fund that was agreed at COP27. So I'll, I'll touch on each of those, those big ones, and then I'll move on to sort of things outside the negotiations. So firstly, the global stock take. Uh, so COP28 is due to finalise the first global stock take, uh, which is the Paris Agreement's mechanism uh, to track collective progress towards the goals of the agreement. It's a really important element of the ratchet and review mechanism, which is at the heart of the, of the agreement. And it's due to take place every five years. So this is the first one. So the Paris Agreement is designed to be a dynamic process in which countries progressively take more ambitious action that is sort of collectively adequate to meet the goals. And this is most clearly established through the five yearly process for the submission of nationally determined contributions or NDCs. So countries submitted uh, their first NDC, NDCs, in, including for most a 2030 emissions reductions target um, in 2015, ahead of the adoption of the Paris Agreement. Collectively, these weren't enough to put emissions on a path to safe warming. 
So many countries submitted an enhanced NDC with a strength strengthened target ahead of COP26, the Glasgow, Glasgow COP in 2021. These collectively brought us closer uh, to a pathway to safe warming, but gaps still remain. Um, so the second NDCs, uh, including which will include for most countries a 2035 target, are due in 2025. And countries in, in con submitting those NDCs have to take into account the outcomes of the first global stock take. So um, when they're developing their NDC and their target. So this is why the global stock take is so important. Um, so for Australia, we want to see a global stock take that delivers both an honest and robust assessment of progress to date. Um, you know, both the positive things that have happened as well as the, as well as the gaps and where actions have been insufficient. But we also want it to deliver a really strong signal of both a global commitment uh, to, to the action necessary to achieve the goals of the agreement. So I can come back a little bit more to the global stock take later, but that's a really important sort of outcome in the context of, of, of the architecture of the Paris Agreement in terms of that ratcheting of ambition. The second um, is the global goal on adaptation. Um, so the Paris Agreement does have a global goal on adaptation to enhance adaptive capacity, to strengthen resilience and to reduce vulnerability to climate change. But recognising how important that is, this year uh, parties will seek to agree a framework which can, I guess, spur increased adaptation action and assess how we're going against that global goal, which is, it's a little bit tricky because it's not, adaptation isn't like mitigation. There's not sort of a, a single number like two degrees that or 1.5 that you can put on adaptation. Adaptation is very sort of concept specific and an adaptation action is, is taken sort of at lo local and regional and national scales. But what we're really keen for is um, a framework that really galvanises international action to accelerate uh, climate adaptation, um, that you have a framework that really promotes effectiveness, effective adaptation outcomes um, and to ensure that the framework is fit for purpose for our region, um, including the Pacific, where adaptation is a priority. So hopefully it's a framework that can highlight areas of good practice and that can create that sort of learning opportunity uh, for countries to go back and look at how they can improve adaptation action at home. For Australia, um, we're, we're deeply involved in these negotiations because Assistant Minister Jenny McAllister has um, accepted an invitation to co-facilitate these negotiations um, uh, with, with a, her counterpart from Chile. Um, so uh, we expect that um, uh, Minister McAllister will be deeply involved in the second week of COP when, when negotiations get handed to ministers after, after officials have, have got as far as they can, they can get. So that's kind of that's adaptation. And then the third big one is um, on loss and damage. Um, you might remember from last year, uh, parties agreed to establish new funding arrangements, including a fund uh, for uh, addressing loss and damage arising from uh, climate change. And they um, commissioned work from a new transitional committee um, on the design of the new fund and funding arrangements. So. Um, the fifth and final meeting of the transitional uh, committee um, happened just last last week on the 3rd and 4th of November, and they successfully finalised recommendations for COP on the design of the new fund and the funding arrangements. So those recommendations will now go to the COP uh, for parties to, to consider um, and, and to hopefully agree on. So I'll just sort of briefly outline sort of uh, where that's at. So, for Australia, we were a member of the Transitional Committee. Um, we re really worked hard to secure an outcome on the design of the new fund that would work for developing countries who are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Um, and in particular, we fo focused on ensuring that the fund would be fit for purpose for the Pacific. And so we worked really closely with the Pacific throughout the process. So kind of a bit of a snapshot of the committee's recommendations. Um, they've recommendation, they've recommendationed, they've recommended um, that the fund be established um, on an interim basis and on a conditional basis as a financial intermediary fund with an independent secretariat housed in the World Bank. But the World Bank does need to meet con conditions, so there is a review review process for that. Um, it recommended that the fund should be able to is to be able to draw from a wide range of sources, public, private, and innovative, and that is so you know um, it, to maximise the scale and the impact of the fund. Um, the fund uh, will also establish a resource allocation system, including a, a minimum percentage allocation floor for small island developing states and least developed countries. Um, 
the board of the fund will be independent, but it will um, receive guidance from parties to the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. Um, and the fund will also enable direct access, which is a really important um, design feature for the Pacific. Uh, the, the committee also um, had recommendations on the broader funding arrangements, not just the fund available across the global financial and, um, and support architecture, and made some recommendations about how to strengthen these arrangements, how to enhance coordination and complementarity between these arrangements, including via the establishment of a high level council uh, to be co-convened by the funds board and the United Nations Secretary General. So that's a bit of a snapshot of where the transitional committee landed. I'll reinforce that these are recommendations of the committee and they need to be agreed by the COP. So that's that was um, a really significant development just that happened last week um, and we'll see that go through go through to Dubai. So that's just a bit um I guess a high level on, on the negotiations. I'm conscious um, I'm running a little short of time but I thought I might talk briefly about the UAE presidency's priorities um, because that's quite important to sort of think about how they're approaching it. And they've they've really laid out what they're describing as you know, the presidency's vision, which is a, a science-based, action-oriented approach to deliver four paradigm shifts at COP. The first is fast-tracking a just and orderly energy transition and slashing emissions before 2030. The second is around transforming climate finance. The third is around putting nature, people, lives and livelihoods at the heart of climate action. And the fourth is mobilising for an inclusive COP. So they're taking this forward through a really comprehensive program of events organised around uh, thematic days. Um, and they're also um, uh, sort of, I guess, uh, conceiving this side of COP as a key complement to negotiated out outcomes. So demonstrating action underway on the ground by a full range of actors to sort of give, give governments confidence in agreeing to ambitious outcomes in the negotiations. So they've got a range of priority initiatives that they're looking to deliver, like a pledge to uh, uh, triple uh, renewable energy generation and double energy efficiency, a declaration um, on sustainable agriculture, uh, resilient food systems and climate action, a declaration on the links between climate and health, and, and a range of others. They're, they're just a few of them. So I think just, I guess, a final comment on the UAE's approach. They have very high ambitions on the action agenda um, and engagement by the full range of, of actors. And they're really hosting a large range of additional and parallel events like a local climate action summit, a business and philanthropy forum, uh, a competitive process to profile innovative projects called energy transition change makers, and much, much more. So it, it's really clear that the UAE is um, well resourced and ambitious. Um, I'm very confident that COP28 will raise the international profile of climate change uh, and hopefully having the effect of um, shoring up political support for for urgent action and and for the opportunities of the global transformation. So there's there's a quick tour um, of COP28, Evan. Um, there are a whole range of other items on the agenda from uh, climate finance through to uh, technical negotiations on markets uh, through to progressing the mitigation work program. Like I said, uh, I could probably talk for 17 hours about the number of things that are on the COP agenda. Um, but I'll save that for two weeks when I'm at COP and, and I'll, I'll hold it there. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Sally. That was a fantastic overview. I, I don't think many people could give such an articulate overview after a 17 hour flight just a few days later. So <laughs> well done. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Box. So as we move into the, the panel section, I, I have some questions that we've prepared, but we'll let them evolve as we go throughout our discussion. But we have Dr. Sally Box, Professor Robin Eckersley, and Richard Fechner to just provide some insights on where they feel like COP28 is going this year. So to launch off that first, uh, the most recently mentioned topic, um, for the next question, I'd love to get the thoughts of Robin and perhaps Sally as well in regards to COP28 amid the UAE's presidency priorities. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, there's a fair amount of controversy around COP this year, primarily around its hosting location. Uh, the reason being, despite UAE's promise to use COP28 to drive some fantastic priorities, um, including, as Sally mentioned, tripling global renewables. We have biodiversity promises that we're looking towards. Um, there's some really great things going there, but the UAE is still the world's seventh largest oil producer and holds the fifth largest gas reserves. So there's a little tension there as well. It seems to me that there's an especially high need, especially at this COP, to rise above that controversy and deliver some really important 
outcomes and sustain the credibility for future conferences. So Robin, I'd love to get your thoughts on that to lead us off. And in general, how important is it to have a successful COP28? Well, thank you, Evan. And thank you, Sally, for a wonderful overview. Of course, we absolutely need a very successful COP28. The global stock take is a crucial milestone and how the countries respond to the you know, technical report on uh, progress so far is absolutely crucial to the success of the Paris Agreement. But I just want to double back a little, a little bit because there have been some controversies about um, Sultan Al Jabbar, the COP president. I, I think Sally's right that he's definitely uh, well situated. He wants uh, uh, an ambitious outcome and quite he's also very pragmatic, but there has been quite a bit of controversy about his nomination as COP president. In fact, and that's not I mean, on the one hand, he's um, the founder of a renewable energy company um, called uh, Mazar, or Abu Dhabi Future en Energy Company. But he's also the chief executive officer of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, um, ADNOG, which is one of the world's largest gas and oil companies. And this has caused a lot of controversy, uh, predictably from transnational climate action groups. But there was also a, pe a petition actually uh, mobilized by members of the European Parliament and the US Congress um, sent to Ursula von der Leyen and also Biden, but also the UNF um, Triple C Executive Secretary and the UN Secretary General uh, protesting over his appointment as the COP uh, president. And so there's quite a few signatures on this particular document and they're complaining about the increasing number of gas and oil lobbyists at recent COPs and also calling for new pro a new protocol uh, on the participation of companies at COP, uh, a kind of audit. So they, they're asking for um, uh, submission of an audited corporate political influence statement. So um, this didn't really go anywhere and the COP's going ahead. And I think we do have an energetic COP, but I think for the audience, it's an interesting development because if that grows, it could start to change how companies mobilize and, and uh, attend the COP and what expectations are in terms of um, their credentials in attending. Now, this is just a possible sign of the future. But more generally, Sally's quite right in identifying the, cr the three crucial issues. I have a lot to say about all of those, particularly just transition, but I'm sure there'll be more questions on that for now. Thanks so much for that synopsis, Robin. That's really helpful. Sally, is there anything that you'd like to add um, in terms of having a successful COP28? Yeah, th thanks. Thanks very much, Evan. I guess it is so important to have a successful uh, COP, um, but it sort of does raise the question of definition, doesn't it? Like, what what is a successful COP? Because each COP is different, and each COP has different things on its agenda. Um, definitely, each COP should absolutely make a genuine contribution um, to to global efforts. But um, because we do have a Paris Agreement, which has sort of this five yearly cycle. Um, genuine contribution doesn't necessarily always have to come in the form of sort of headline ambition commitments. And I think it's important to recognise that, I guess, it, as important is moving forward in that sort of complex world of, world and work of, of implementation. So I think, I think we need to sort of think about um, what is a successful COP in a, in a, in a perhaps a, a, a little bit more of a comprehensive way. Um, certainly acknowledge the concerns raised about the UAE presidency. I guess I just just note that solving this climate crisis does require um, effort from all, um, and that you, the UNFCCC is a consensus-based body. And so the reality is that those countries with fossil fuel reliant economies are going to need to figure out alternatives, um, and that the multi multilateral process has a role in um, holding those countries. Uh, to account and helping and, and ensuring that they make genuine efforts to decarbonise. But it also has a role to play in sharing experiences and effective approaches. Uh, and that's where I think Australia is hoping that we can kind of model in this regard, you know, sharing of our experiences in our efforts to get to 82% renewables by 2030 um, and, and how we can sort of contribute to the global effort. So, yeah, I think that's, that's all I'll add on that one. Thanks, Evan. All right. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, 
As we return to the global stock take, as we mentioned priorities, this has been a long time in development. And alongside the global stock take, just recently, the UN Global Compact recently released its Forward Faster campaign, which is designed to accelerate our progress towards the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. And this year at COP28, we have the global stock take, we're taking a look at it, and we've been engaged on the technical dialogue, and we've provided submissions on implementation, adaptation, climate finance, loss and damage, science, research, and technology. Is there anything else that you want to add? You mentioned you have some more to add, Sally, in terms of the global stock take. And Robin, I would like to get your thoughts on this as well. And then maybe, uh, and Richard, I'll direct some questions to you as well in regards to the private sector. But if you could kick us off just with those further thoughts that you have on the global stock take, that'd be great, Sally. Thank you so much. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, maybe I'll just sort of quickly touch on kind of what it is, because even what it is seems to be kind of debated. Um, what we can probably expect and then what, I guess, as what Australia hopes to see, I might just try and touch on touch on each of those. But um, I think, like I said, the Global Stock Take is the Paris Agreement's mechanism to track collective progress towards the Paris Agreement's goals. Now, that all sounds very simple, but there are a lot of sort of contentions here. So first, so first, what are the Paris Agreement goals? Um, for Australia and for most sort of climate progressives in the UNFCCC, if I can count ourselves amongst them, these are the goals set out in Article 2.1, uh, as well as the global goal on adaptation. So the, the 2.1 goals are the temperature goals, 2 and 1.5 degrees, which you're familiar with. Secondly, it's a global goal uh, to increase resilience to, to climate change. So there's the adaptation. And then there's a goal to make finance flows consistent with low greenhouse uh, emissions and climate resilient development. But not everyone agrees with this. Other parties also consider that there are goals to do with climate finance, with capacity building, with technology transfer, with loss and damage, with response measures and other issues. And we consider that they're really important as well and that they're really material to the achievement of the goals, even if they aren't goals themselves. The other thing that's contentious is around how backward looking versus forward looking uh, this review of collective progress is. For Australia and for many others, um, both are equally important. We need to know how we're tracking towards their achievement, but it's also urgently important to understand how we might close the gaps. So um, for some other countries, it's really just about identifying progress alone and for any forward-looking component to be captured through NDCs. So this is the, what the global stock take is, is even something that's kind of being talked about. So what can we expect? So I think negotiations on the global stock take outcomes will at least will be based at least partly on the technical dialogues that's taken place, place as part of the process over the last couple of years. And those technical dialogues were very strongly informed by the IPCC six assessment report. So we can expect a global stock take based on science and we'll be strongly defending that. One thing that parties also agree on is that the stock take outcomes balance that sense of urgency with a sense of hope, going back to what you reflected on earlier, Evan. So while we expect there to be a very clear effect, ref, reflection on the significant sort of gaps in the achievement of the goals, including the 1.5 and 2 degree temperature goals, we can also expect to see some very positive messages about the achievements that we've been made to date. Net zero targets, uh, the peaking of many parties emissions, uh, the coverage we've got of NDCs. And we can also expect to see the global stock take see strong calls for additional action. Um, where parties disagree is uh, who takes the action and how is it paid for, which is, you know, um, it, it's, a, it, it's a debate that, that, that persists in the forum. In terms of what we hope to see very briefly, we want the state to see the stock take cover progress to, well, towards all the Paris goals. Uh, we're particularly focused on the mitigation outcomes, given the narrow window to keep 1.5 degrees alive and because of the link between the stock take and the next NDC. So we, we really want our key asks are to elevate the call to keep 1.5 degrees within reach um, for the next NDCs of all parties and particularly major emitters to be ambitious to include absolute economy wide emissions reduction targets covering all sectors and gases uh, for all countries to peak emissions by 2025. Uh, for the acceleration in the um, uptake and investment in clean energy um, and the phase out of unabated fossil fuel use uh, in our energy systems. And we really want to elevate the importance of aligning all global financial flows with the goals of the agreement. Um, so, so I think, um, I guess that's just sort of briefly, I think what, what we're seeking. Um, I think it'll be um, I think it, these will be tough negotiations. Um, but like I said, we want to balance the 
backwards looking and the forwards looking, uh, the sense of hope with the sense of urgency um, and, and, the, and the balance across all three goals of the Paris Agreement. We need a strong outcome on mitigation and adaptation and finance. Thanks, Evan. I love the tropes of hope and urgency. Uh, that, that fits so nicely together. Robin, is there anything that you wanted to add on um, our engagement in the global stock take? Absolutely. Um, um, you know, diplomats often say a conference is either successful or very successful. <laughs> um, if it's to be actually, or, or you can judge it relative to what, to the counterfactual of no agreement or no action so far, or distance from the collective optimum. And I'm the latter person when I when I judge performance or when I raise expectations. So the global stock take has sort of three elements. One was simply gathering information across a large volume of different items, not just mitigation, and then assessing progress against those items so far. And Sally referred to a technical dialogue report. And then considering the outputs that the parties would agree to, uh, which would then feed into the next round of NDCs. Now that last process is a very, it's the most political process. It's all political, but that's the most political process, and um, it's very hard to predict exactly where this would go in the end. But looking through um, this, the technical dialogue paper, there's a few things that are really emphasised here. Um, clearly, the mitigation is not enough. There's a big gap, and key finding number four was that global emissions have to be cut by. 43% by 2030 and a further 60% by 2035 from 2019 levels. Now, Australia's target is minus 43 from 2005 levels. And of course, rich countries should be doing a lot more to cut some slack for developing countries. So there's a, a task for our government right there. What I noticed reading through all of this was a kind of attempt to try and inter a, a focus on system-wide transformation was really coming through quite a lot across all sectors and all contexts, obviously scaling up renewable energy and phasing out all unabated fossil fuel, that unabated word comes from COP26, looking at deforestation, uh, other non-CO2 sources of emission, implementing both supply and demand side measures. So we're seeing not just a whole of economy response, but a whole of society response, and also an increasing focus on just transition as well. So. Um, what I also noted was um, this report said that the uh, new jobs emerging from just energy trans transitions were potentially 3.5 times greater than the job losses from legacy industries by 2030. So that's a really positive bit of news there. Uh, and it would be higher if, if, if parties um, galvanised more. Um, the COP president's trying to work hard on this by setting up a high-level committee that includes the members of the two technical committees. Um, I won't go into more details there, but there's going to be a, a World Action Summit um, in early December. This is a kind of public-private partnership founded in 2010, which runs alongside uh, the main COP. It's like the investment COP. And there's going to be a high-level event there on the um, global stock take. So I think a lot of viewers... Uh, of this webinar may be interested in that. Just Google World Action Climate Summit and it's got an action-packed two-day program. But this is really, really crucial milestone. And because, as Sally said, time is, is of the essence when it comes to mitigation, um, it's really about um, all hands on deck. Thanks for that, Robin. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. All hands on deck. And you mentioned jobs, which is a nice segue for me to pick the brain of Richard. Uh, Richard, I have a few questions lined up as we transition to really looking at how we can engage the private sector. But do you have any thoughts on the topic of the global stock take in relation to engagement in Australia's private sector or with? Yeah, well, thanks, Evan. Uh, and there's been a lot said already, but there's a couple of things I'd like to... Uh... To add to on the global stock take, um, I think is a really important baseline for both governments and the private sector. Um, you know, having a, a common set of data, you can debate the inputs to that or not, but measuring the progress by those data sets is really important. Um, and that's equally important for, for companies, you know, themselves, um, their communities, and for all investors. The data set is really critical because that collective benchmarking um, and decision-making measurement of change is important. There's always uh, external considerations um, and economic forces, but the reinforcement of action against the plan 
And as Sally said, to keep that 1.5 you know degrees te uh, temperature change in reach is so critical. I, th I think Australia can really take some market leadership in this space and stronger than we have. And it's not just for the private sector as an issue, but you know policy and uh, incentive for private sector to change must be enabled as well. Um, I think it's important um, that use of the data, I think, you know, to reflect upon the change needed. Um, I think we've all, uh, across the globe, we've all had plenty of time to admire the problem, but we haven't probably made the call to action as strongly as we need to. And how the, the private sector can make a stronger call to action, I'll probably talk a bit later. There's lots of transitions to, happy, to happen, and I'm glad that Robin raised the, uh, the job transition as well. Um, and I think that there's, there's early signs of that job transition starting. We're seeing educational institutions, um, TAFEs and universities really start to support those transitions in, uh, in centres in rural Australia. So I think, no, th there's evidence coming through from the stock take or that further insight into how all those transitions must take place. So thanks, Evan. Thanks, Richard. Uh, thanks so much for that. So when we look at the use of data, um, and use use of our influence and I'm um, pushing for that just transition. I want to I want to move towards that in a little bit. Um, but returning to our participants at the UNGCNA, one of the most exciting things I see from them are organizations that are willing to step up. And I saw a question in here about our influence in fossil fuels and influence into meeting um, the Paris Agreement for the private sector. Um, and I see our participants kind of through their organizations, answering some of the biggest challenges related to climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, and according to a recent um, stock take report uh, from the UN Global Compact, um, which surveyed over uh, surveyed nearly 3,000 business leaders, uh, the private sector is a critical stakeholder in achieving the SDGs, which we now know have largely gone off track. Um, so as you're sending a large contingent to COP28 this year, Richard, um, Moving forwards for some of the priorities that we've discussed, what are some of your priorities at COP28, especially driving that influence that the private sector has? What are you seeing as high priority areas for Australian businesses? Uh, would you be able to provide some of your insights on those areas? Yeah, sure. Lots of uh, lot, lot questions around that, uh, Evan, but and lo lots of input. But yeah, we're returning to COP28 this year. Um, and we are going to be very strong on the ground uh, across GHD, and we're more than doubling the level up of participants that'll be active compared to uh, last. And there's a really solid program of activity regarding the influence that we want to have and will have there. Um, we're, we're taking deep experience, and that's in, in technical expertise in areas of sustainability, resilience, ESG, and really adding to the COP discussion as well as you know the transition that needs to take place with their communities, uh, with energy and with the water sector. And it's really with a particular focus of sharing constructive perspectives on the opportunities that lie ahead. And they are those opportunities in that complex um, as we view it with energy, water and community. Our delegation is contributing in a number of ways in both the blue and green zones at COP, as well as Climate Action Sustainable Innovation Forum. We have a strategic partnership with Climate Action to bring together global corporate and government decision makers to accelerate the change needed. We're also hosting in-person events and the goal there is to unpack the topic that's been mentioned uh, by Robin of a just transition with industry leaders across multiple sectors. And our real intent there is to explore a delicate balancing act required to bring a fair and just transition alongside sustainable development action. That event will bring together quite an eclectic mix of international leaders to provide much needed multi-sector, public and private sector perspectives on the practicality of a just transition. And finally, I'd like to mention on the eve of COP28, GHD Advisory is launching a sustainability monitor. And that's a piece of global research that we've, we've developed to identify the gap and the challenges that really sit in that spot between sustainability ambition and implementation action. We've surveyed over about 600 C-level executives from around the world. And we've also interviewed a large panel of our clients to delve deeper into charting what is a path forward that points to best practices and learnings from those who are leaders in both sustainability and business growth. 
And from the the uh, the pre-release version, if you like, of that monitor, I'd just like to raise a couple of topics that uh, we're seeing. Firstly, sustainability remains front and centre in people's minds, as it should. And 95% of the respondents have told us that sustainability is really central to their organisation's vision and strategy. That's a very positive message. But integrating sustainability into the fabric of the organisations is proving far more difficult as it demands a greater level of stakeholder engagement and change management for those private sector organisations than exists today. Secondly, sustainability is seen to add commercial value. An overwhelming 97% of those surveyed believe that sustainability agenda is really adding commercial value to their businesses. There's one transport client that told us the huge growth driver for their business, and it's an important narrative for all to tell the market, as it supports and it aids their access to capital. However, the capital expenditure investment side and sourcing those funds and priorities in the current economic climate remains a challenge. What we're seeing is a large gap between vision and strategy and what's actually being done with boots on the ground. And when they were all asked, what is the biggest gap? Decarbonisation came out on top, Evan. So there'll be a lot more to read from that and we'll release that document um, just prior to COP. Great. Thanks for that, Richard. Yeah, you mentioned some interesting things here, that that path forward uh, through leaders in sustainability and business growth, which is almost an unlikely partnership in a way, right? Uh, there's some ways that we can tease that out as theoretical opposites, uh, especially in materiality debates, uh, but they're increasingly paired together. Uh, that idea of stakeholder engagement, change management comes, uh, those ideas are tops uh, when we're talking to our participants. And as we pair those together, uh, one of the biggest topics as we that we look at and which everyone seems to be champing at the bit to discuss is our just transition. Um, so Dr. Box mentioned that there's increasing discussion on engagement um, with those that are most impacted at COP28. Uh, that discussion, um, from what I understand, uh, specifically gears towards youth and uh, global Indigenous communities. Um, and then moving on from the recent referendum failure, Australia has been further engaged in just transition declaration, the just transition declaration that was initiated at COP26. Um, so maybe if I could return to Robin and get your thoughts about um, just transition engagement in terms of possibly both national policy and Australian positioning as well, um, supporting those that are most impacted by climate change at a global level. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Evan. Um, yes, Australia signed um, the Just Transition Declaration uh, at COP27 last year. And um, this, of course, is an inter a global just transition declaration that's got the usual principles in it about looking after workers affected by the closure of uh, fossil fuel and other legacy industries and also stakeholder engagement with those most affected by transition. But it also includes other principles like um, ensuring that supply chains that are required for the transition create decent work and uphold human rights and so forth. This is dear to the hearts of members of the Global Compact. And not only that, that the signatories also pursue just transition nationally and also report about that in their NDCs. So this is a big obligation. And um, Nationally, the government has started to move in this space with um, announcing the development of a, of a net zero authority, a new statutory authority. It's not yet brought into being. They've created an interim net zero economic agency um, headed by former climate minister, Greg Combe, uh, supported by a board to sort of play a precursor role to this authority and also help to develop the um, exposure draft of the new legislation. So this is definitely looking after workers, industries and communities, you know, in regional Australia where there have been dependencies on fossil fuels, but more generally the authorities to help investors engage with net zero transformations and coordinate uh, programs. So this is going to require unprecedented cooperative federalism. Uh, so this is, this is a, an important move, but what would Australia do? Um, it, it's still not thoroughly integrated with its decarbonisation strategy. There's a net zero task force inside the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet working on six decarbonisation strategies across all the sectors you'd, you'd expect. 
And again, the website says they're also interested in stakeholder engagement, another key component of Just Transition, but it's not that public. To make, it needs to be a more mission-oriented approach with it's not just whole of economy, but whole of society. And there's a lot of wisdom and enthusiasm in local groups to be engaged in this. So I hope this becomes more public. But internationally, Australia um, can do a lot. Um, Australia has, I think, eight clean energy partnerships, but all but one are with developed countries. We need more of them with developing. We have one with India, a critical minerals um, arrangement, which um, increases India's access to our critical minerals. But I think Australia can do a lot more in the region. Uh, COP26 saw the beginning of just transition energy partnerships launched with a large bunch of donors working with particular countries that are very dependent on fossil fuels, like South Africa or Vietnam or Senegal or um, even Indonesia. And so Australia could consider getting involved in some of those and, and actually helping developing countries go through the energy transition. Because the key thing about just transition, this is my, my final comment, is a lot of people think, oh, we've got to decarbonise as fast as possible. This is going to slow things down. But all the research on just transition shows that actually just transition, just transition is an enabler of the transition because it, it enables consultation and looking after those most affected and therefore builds a social license for that tr transition to ensure that it's durable. If you rush too fast, the whole thing will fall over and we don't get anywhere. So I think that's the real lesson of the research in this area. That's really, really helpful, Robin. Um, as an enabler, uh, Richard, um, you made some comments previously in terms of global risks and opportunities for business in regards to the just transition. Can you maybe elaborate on maybe enabling or opportunities that the private sector has in accelerating decarbonization through the just transition and what global trends we may, to, may need to address? Is there anything that you'd like to add there? Yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, I think there's a couple of things, but certainly the recognition that transforming the global energy systems is going to be costly and um, and it was a necessary investment for the future. But the investment will impact on energy prices and it will drive inflation in the short term. And these costs are invariably borne by consumers everywhere. Um, it's a substantial cost felt by many, but it's not shared equally. And uh, it's felt often most by those that can least afford it. So the most vulnerable members of society tend to wear a greater proportion um, of that risk. Um, and that's, you know, we've got to handle that, whether it be climate risk or socioeconomic perspective, those people have the most to lose. I think decision makers need to consider what is really complex issues around human, economic and economic trade-off. And private and public sector have got to be... Um, more aware perhaps in charting more accessible and equitable pathways um, in that sense. You know, we, uh, we, we've we canvassed a bunch of uh, energy leaders globally um, and there are a number of approaches adopted that is a bit different in each country and how that's dealt with. Um, the first is the most supported approach was low interest loans to energy companies to help smooth wholesale price increases and that's a strategy backed strongly in Canada, New Zealand, and the US. The second most supported is around intervention with energy bill reduction funded through general taxation. And uh, that, that's something that's done particularly in Singapore and to a degree here as well. The third was levies on energy bills to subsidise the poorest in society. And that's an approach predominantly backed in the Philippines. So there's lots of differences, if you like, of where we operate and where we're active in projects. The challenges are significant, but I think it's that activation of a variety of paths forward, but always making sure we're keeping um, the socioeconomic perspective in mind and balancing that for the most vulnerable members of our community, um, Evan. So there's lots to do. The private sector has a part to play, but like these, it's always done in unison with uh, with governments in regions. Yeah, yeah, some really good points there. I wish we had time to tease them out a little bit, but um, I'm trying to move um, quickly through our last few questions. But Sally, just a little bit more on this. Um, in terms of those most affected, what, is, what do you see Australia doing, um, especially in relation to engaging those most affected through a just transition? 
Thanks, Evan. Well, I think um, um, Robin has touched on sort of what Australia is doing through the, through the Net Zero Authority, which I think is, the, is sort of a, a really important development in a, in a sort of Australia's sort of domestic uh, sort of policy settings in, term, in, in thinking about how do we support workers in emissions intensive se sectors to access sort of employment and, and, and skills and support, uh, support them sort of as the net zero transformation continues. Um, I think, interestingly, we're seeing this as a, a stronger growing agenda in the UNFCCC and at COP28 this year, we're, um, we're due to decide on, I guess, uh, the, the scope and the sort of mode of work for a new just transition work program. And, and, and we think that's re really important and we really welcome it and see it as an opportunity for us to really kind of share um, experiences and lessons learned with other countries as we're all sort of going through this transition together and looking at how we how we support and enable workers through this transition. Uh, I guess one of the points that we've been really making uh, internationally is that it's so important that uh, that these discussions in the UNFCCC on just transition aren't just a, a discussion between governments, that they do engage a wide range of stakeholders you know, industry, civil society, community, those who are most impacted. So that um, those perspectives are really, really brought into the UNFCCC. It's sort of, it's something that kind of doesn't, doesn't quite, doesn't quite happen uh, enough, I don't think, but we are seeing it through the, through the mitigation work program and, and through some other new work programs in the UNFCCC about how do you more strongly bring, bring in those other voices. Um, I guess just uh, to sort of comment, make an additional comment on, on First Nations engagement, this is something that the Australian government's really looking to, to do, um, but both domestically, but, but also internationally, how do we sort of bring, better, better bring First Nations voices and perspectives um, into, the, into the UNFCCC. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we hosted a Pacific regional gathering of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, as well as Indigenous people from the Pacific and from New Zealand to come together to talk about um, sort of climate impacts and climate action. Um, it, was a, it was a mandated event under the UNFCCC and those, the outcomes and ideas that came from that will, will, be, will be fed back into the process. And we're also supporting um, a large number of First Nations people to actually come to COP, participate in our pavilion and directly input into the process. So um, it's, uh, it, it's something that the, the government's really interested in, in doing better at. Um, and, and these are just a few ways that we, we're kind of focusing on it uh, this year as we go into COP28. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm seeing so many good questions coming through the um, Q&A here. Um, Sally, I'll just hit you up with two more in the last two minutes that we have uh, real quick. Um, one, I saw a question about um, agriculture and land. We've had so much development in the nature and biodiversity space over this last year. We have the outcomes of the GBF last year, just after COP27. Um, and then we have the release of TNFD and SBTN has had a couple releases this year as well. Um, do you see an integration, just real quick, on um, an increased focus, I guess, on integration between um, climate and nature and biodiversity? Uh, the short answer is, is yes. Um, we've got I mean, obviously, biodiversity loss and 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 climate change are really interdependent challenges that need a, you know, that need to be addressed harmoniously. And we see the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement explicitly recognise uh, the importance of ensuring ecosystem integrity. And we see the new global biodiversity framework having having targets around climate change. So we're seeing the harmonisation at that. Um, at that global global level, and an increasing interest in, in in looking at this in an integrated way, sort of in the forums. Uh, I mean, interest, nature based solutions was um, it was really last year at COP that we saw the the first UNFCCC cover decision with reference to nature based solutions kind of included and locked in. So that's that's significant in itself. I mean, I think a further step is how do we better use market mechanisms to um, unlock sort of greater non-carbon uh, benefits. Um, you know, we're seeing the development of that at home in terms of the Australian government trying to develop the, the nature repair market. Um, and I think they're sort of conversations that we hope to expand on at COP and in the sort of Nature Positive Summit that Australia is hosting next year. I expect a very strong focus on the nature climate nexus at COP, the high level uh, uh, champion um, is also the 
head of the IECN um, and is very, very keen on seeing a strong nature focus at COP. And we've seen that through some of the initiatives um, that the that the presidency is putting forward, in, in, including on mangroves and, and food systems, et cetera. So uh, short, that was a long way of saying yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So for the last question, it's two o'clock. It's time to go. Um, in regards to future COPs, Australia is actively pursuing COP31 in partnership with our Pacific Island neighbors. Are there any developments in regards to this as an actuality? Is there a timeline for announcement? We have 10 seconds to share your thoughts or updates. 10 seconds. Okay. Yes, we are bidding <laughs> to um, host COP31 in, in 2026 in partnership with the Pacific Pacific leaders have warmly endorsed this proposal. Uh, the Turkey um, is also bidding uh, to host COP31, um, so which we absolutely respect. And so we're sort of working with them on a way forward. Um, so, so no, no big announcements for you, I'm afraid, Evan. Uh, but yes, we do have a bid. Uh, we're working with Turkey. We've got, we've had some great discussions with the Pacific about the opportunity that this would bring. Um, we know that uh, many of our wheel Partners are very supportive of, of Australia's bid in partnership with the Pacific, uh, but it is still um, a live negotiation. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, everyone. And thanks for the comments. Uh, we are out of time. Um, but I wanted to say thank you again to our fantastic panelists, our speakers, our programming team. Um, thank you so very much. We are so appreciative to have you and such an amazing panel today. Um, if you're a UNGCNA participant and you're going to COP this year, let us know. We'd love to hear from you and hear what you're doing. Um, if you haven't joined, join. We have um, a bunch of events coming up. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you again. <laughs>